Are we satisfied if kids come out of school passive, docile, compliant, frightened of making mistakes, and needing to be constantly chivied and directed the whole time? You know, is that a, a desirable side effect of those 12 long years or however many? Or is that unwanted? You know, and to me, when you put it like that, it sounds like that's the very antithesis of what I would like my children and everybody's children to come out of school feeling like. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Hello. Welcome to episode seven of the Rethinking Education podcast. Guy Claxton really needs no introduction, but here goes anyway. Guy is a hugely influential academic and thinker and the author of over 20 books now on learning, intelligence and creativity, including books like Hairbrain Tortoise Mind, What's the Point of School? and the learning power approach, to name just some. Guy writes brilliantly, and his latest book, The Future of Teaching and the Myths That Hold It Back, is no exception. It's a blistering critique of what is increasingly a neo-traditional orthodoxy, and I cannot wait for it to hit the shelves in a few short months and to start ruffling people's feathers. Guy has very kindly agreed to come back on the show in the spring when the book comes out. At this point, we will discuss the future of teaching in great detail, but today we're going to have a much more expansive conversation about education and about our shared passion, teaching young people how to teach themselves. As some of you may be aware, 10 years ago, I became involved in designing and teaching a taught learning to learn curriculum to secondary school where I was working and I spent the next eight years evaluating the impact of it for my PhD. It took eight years because we followed four cohorts of children from year seven through to year 11, one control cohort and three learning to learn cohorts. Those young people who took part in the learning skills curriculum went on to get the best set of results that that school had ever seen by some margin And in particular, it was especially beneficial for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So the disadvantage gap closed by over 65% from one cohort to the next at GCSE. I recently wrote up the findings of this study in a book that I co-authored with my friend Kate McAllister. That book is called Fear is the Mind Killer, Why Learning to Learn Deserves Lesson Time and How to Make It Work for Your Pupils. To a significant degree, the success of the learning skills curriculum can be attributed to Guy's writing on the topic of learning to learn over the last 20 years or so. Guy has an enviable knack for expressing ideas about learning to learn that I have thought about for years but struggled to express. To give you a flavour, I will end this introduction with a couple of short excerpts from his recent book, The Learning Powered Approach. Here's the first one. Schools should be preparing kids to flourish in a complicated and demanding world. Just trying to squeeze better test scores out of them is not enough. We know that in the long run, character counts for more than examination results. To prosper, to live good lives, today's students will need curiosity, determination, concentration, imagination, camaraderie, thoughtfulness and self-discipline, as well as literacy, numeracy, general knowledge and the best possible grades. These attributes contribute hugely to people's success and fulfilment in life, and we also know that they are capable of being intentionally developed or unintentionally stifled. The desire to cultivate them has to be at the heart of every school's endeavour. And here is the second excerpt in which Guy suggests that the question of how to develop these character traits is cultural rather than curricular. Such dispositions cannot be taught directly. Of course they can be made explicit and talked about, and that helps, but merely understanding the concept of resilience, say, 
and even being able to write an A-grade essay about it does not by itself make you any more resilient. Character is a constellation of habits, and habits are tendencies that are built up over time. If you regularly find yourself in a culture, a family for example, where the people you look up to continually model, value and expect politeness, honesty or curiosity, you are likely to grow towards those qualities as a plant grows towards the sun. Such habits begin to become part of your natural way of being. I hope you enjoy the show. Guy Claxton, welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. Thank you very much for having me, James. Pleasure to be with you. One of the reasons that I've been keen to talk to you um, is that you, uh, there's a recent book that you wrote, which uh, we don't we don't want to say too much about uh, just yet. But um, over the last sort of 10 or 15 years or so, I've been so influenced by much of your writing. You write absolutely brilliantly. Yeah, thank you. That's kind. Well, it's true. Um, I can't remember the first thing that I came across. It was probably Building Learning Power, the initial book that you wrote. But it was the it was a sort of a pamphlet that you published called uh, Learning to Learn the Fourth Generation. Uh-huh, that, yeah. that I was just found so helpful because, as you know, I've been on a journey into learning to learn myself for the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, and you published that in around 2006, I believe. Yeah, something like that. Although, you know, I, I've been on the journey since the first the first book about learning to learn that I wrote was, I think, in 1984 or something like that. So uh, I've been making haste slowly along this important road. <laughs> and I, I don't, although, although I may have had a few years start on you, I don't feel as if I'm much, if at all, ahead of you, let's say. Well, I I would beg to differ there. I, mean, but I think that so when I when I read this this piece, uh, learning to learn the fourth generation, which just very briefly sort of outlines the, a number of sort of waves of thinking, if you like, maybe it would be maybe it would be useful to just briefly outline for listeners what the what the four generations are as you see them. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in a, in a way, it's an attempt to capture an intellectual journey, but it's also my journey um through you know having having grown and deepened and made a whole lot of mistakes which some other people have made as well in my thinking so i sort of i date the start of it from actually i have to revise that because in your book you date the start of learning to learn from a influential publication by jerome bruno which i'm ashamed to say i didn't know about back in the mid 1960s But sort of round about then also, maybe the 1970s, 1980s, there was an interest in um, sort of study skills, uh, hints and tips, revision cards, very much tied to the curriculum, um, tied to how how you can mug up school stuff better. Um, And that was a, you know, that was that was a start. And then I'm not sure if I can remember the exact. This is sort of notional chronology rather than uh, actual chronology. But then we all went through the sort of hints and tips, uh, a bit of neuro babble, and a bit of visual auditory and kinesthetic learning, and a bit of having to sit water all the time, and a bit of um, mind maps. Um, and they were all well intentioned. Um, attempts to help kids learn more effectively. In other words, to begin to pay attention to what was going on at the receiver's end, rather than putting all our attention on what's going on at the transmitter's end. So it was the beginning of that sort of healthy track. But as we all know, that sort of what I now come to call have called the tinsel approach, just like, like sprinkling little bits of hints and tips around the curriculum um was as i was was well intentioned but the science didn't didn't back it up it didn't back it up about sipping water didn't back it up about being able to neatly divide kids into three categories of auditory visual and kinesthetic learners uh and so on and so on then i think we uh we went up into thinking skills into treating thinking there was, was a big shift into thinking 
but to treating what we could do as if they were skills, as if thinking was something like welding or cookery or something that could be trained. Um, and that was that was an improvement because we were we were getting a bit a bit more into the detail of uh, of what was going on inside learners and thinkers' minds. But um, I've always had trouble with the word skills because it gives this kind of it's something you can just kind of tack on with a bit of practice. Whereas I think if we move on into the other generations through multiple intelligences we we all went through the phase of of uh, following howard gardner um and a, a, like a lot of things you know you'll be familiar with and i'm familiar with a lot of these things get as they become more complicated so it becomes harder for the essence of them to be retained in the classroom no disrespect to teachers, but it's sort of, you know, they're not, most teachers are not academics. They're not reading psychological literature. And so things have a habit of getting boiled down. And it's happened with my own work with building learning power, get boiled down into something a bit formulaic that preserves one or two of the letters of what's going on, but somewhere along the line loses the spirit. So we had multiple intelligences, we had thinking skills, which that the evidence shows were often disappointing if you were teaching things like Edward de Bono's court learning materials and higher order thinking skills and so on. But the the problem with treating these things as skills is that not enough attention was paid to the fact that what we're trying to cultivate in kids' minds are dispositions, not just skills. That is to say, not just things that they can do when prompted, but things that they spontaneously do do that are, and this is, I thank David Perkins for this very important distinction, things that are dispositional. That's to say, Perkins' phrase is, we not only have skill, but we have sensitivity to occasion. In other words, where there's something in our brains that lights up, which says, ah, now's the time to use this critical thinking. Ah, now would be the time, not necessarily consciously, of course, to use my imagining or my empathy skills or my persistence or whatever it might be. So I think where we are now is mo we've moved into that sort of more dispositional, which you get, which is more almost in the territory of personality, you might say, rather than skill. So we have to use words like cultivate or culture. Uh, we have to start thinking in terms of habit change rather than simply tacking on a technical accomplishment to what's going on. And I think where we are now is sort of beyond the dispositional approach, which is seeing that from the teacher's point of view, that what is vitally important is the culture we create in the classroom, which naturally, often implicitly or unconsciously invites children, students into a world of persistence and enjoying challenge and experimentation and curiosity and you can't just do that with a few slogans and a few of what dear tom sherrington calls the cheesy growth mindset posters stuck up on the walls of the classroom so i think where we are now is seeing that if we're going to do this properly there is no other way there is no shortcut than thinking deeply about the way we create the culture in the classroom and what that means and what all those different aspects of the culture are. So, you know, that's been my journey. And I think that it reflects to a significant extent the journey of the field as a whole. I don't know if you'd agree, James. I very much agree. Um, and I, as I say, I found that publication really useful because I was in the middle. I, I discovered it probably around 2012 when I was sort of two years into trying to implement uh, a learning to learn curriculum at my school, which, as you know, I subsequently evaluated and wrote mm. up for my PhD. Um, and I, I just found it very useful because it was... Although, although if you look back over the history of that of that sort of let's say call it a forty or fifty year period, say since like Flavel and Anne Brown and others started talking about metacognition, seems to me to be when it really sort of got going. Um, the people have taken, like you say, people have taken different different ways of perceiving what it is to 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 learn how to learn stuff, 
and study skills and exam techniques is a part of that. Mm. And some of that stuff that you were talking about, about the third generation, when, when people were were becoming more more interested in things like the emotional climate of the classroom and mm. self-esteem and, and, you know, social and emotional aspects of learning and so on. Um, and it seems to me that all of these things have a grain of truth in them that, that like learning like, like with the thing that you're talking about i mean i think that the simple aim of learning to learn is to create young people who are autodidactic and, mm-hmm. and it seems like the school system is sometimes set up to achieve the precise opposite of that that it's just all about what the teachers can do yes. to cram stuff into kids heads and we intervene and swoop in uh, endlessly until they get to the end of school to get as many possible exam results out of them as we can but the, the young people then aren't really set up for a life where they can, you know, learn under their own steam. Yeah. Um, and But this is a complicated problem, and it's simultaneously cognitive and metacognitive, and knowledge is really important, and emotions are really important. And um, there's it's a very sort of complicated picture, if you like, and it's, it seems like the history of the Learning to Learn movement has been an exploration of, of all of these sort of things, almost as, they, as though they were individual strands, as though it's like, yes. is this the silver bullet that's going to create this autodidactic yes. future, or is this the silver bullet? And it feels like we need to have something that's a bit more complex and multi-layered, like you say, and it's about the culture of the classroom, and it's about the things that teachers say and don't say, and the extent to which we we set the direction for learning and also when to stand back and allow the young people to find out what they can and can't do under their own steam. So it's a complex endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like another shift, which you you indicated strongly uh, just then, was from being concerned with like, what's the point of learning to learn and there's been, I think, certainly for me and you and lots of people, I think that it's been a shift from how can we help them do better on the tests to how can we help them build a kind of orientation towards learning, towards, you know, lifelong learning. It's a phrase which has sort of been and gone a bit, but I'm still stuck with it, as you say, to be autodidactic, to be able we ought to be doing things in schools which make people more, you say, autodidactic, more independent, more resilient, more curious, you know, in broad terms, out in the out in the big wide world. <clears throat> Whereas often school, I often think now that school is a long apprenticeship in learning to be taught rather than in learning to learn. So it's not surprising that a lot of people come out of school not very good in my my terminology not very powerful learners not very independent um not very good at thinking carefully around complex issues um but you know but maybe good at getting qualifications <clears throat> excuse me and passing passing exams so you know i'm in mean, a simple way that i sum up you know what i'm thinking about at the moment is to be looking at that sort of the set of dispositions that kids come out of school with and just ask ourselves, you know, are we satisfied if kids come out of school passive, docile, compliant, frightened of making mistakes and needing to be constantly chivied and directed the whole time? You know, is that a, a desirable side effect of those 12 long years or however many? Or is that unwanted? You know, and to me, when you put it like that, it sounds like that's the very antithesis of what I would like my children and everybody's children to come out of school feeling like, you know, I want them to be more adventurous. I went to a school a little while ago whose school motto was live adventurously. And I really like that, you know, school mottos are usually just, you know, they don't say anything. Yeah. But I like the idea, particularly in the 21st century. It's like if you're not going to live adventurously, if you're not going to be open to diversity, to curiosity, to change and so on, you're going to let get left behind. There's a quote that people used a lot about something. Was it something like the, the if you don't learn to learn, then, you know, you'll be merely learn ed beautifully equipped to cope with a world that no longer exists. Mm. So, you know, that it's that distinction about shif- shifting from the focus being on learned. And we want kids to be learn- learned about some things, but not dispositionally learned. 
I like it. So learned is a past tense form. Mm, yeah. Yeah. But but we need we know as you and I agree you need to get beyond the false opposition between knowledge and skills. It's both, duh, isn't it? Yeah. So it's not like we we don't reject the learnedness. Of course, we want kids to know stuff, but it's that underlying residue of dispositions that is that worries me. Yes. And so and so we're having this conversation in 2020, and I think it's worth mentioning that I mean, um, you know, we've been on this sort of 50 year journey into learning to learn, and it felt like it sort of peaked in terms of the the numbers of schools, just in terms of the sheer numbers of schools that were having sort of taught learning to learn type lessons and the, the, using the language of learning to learn. It feels like it peaked around the sort of the 2000s, the mid 2000s. I started my thing in 2010 when it was probably starting to wind down. And as you know, we sort of had a change of government around then and a big change in direction. And under the new Labour administration, there was a big emphasis on skills, wasn't there? Um, skills based learning. And we had the personal learning and thinking skills framework and the yes. social and emotional aspects of learning and so on. And then we've had this big swing the other way because people were saying that, you know, people were talking about skills as though they were generic, as though they were something that could be uh, constructed and, and developed in the abstract so that regardless of what you know about a subject, you would be able to think critically about it. And then the people have started to pay more attention to cognitive scientists like Daniel Willingham, who sort of say, you need to know a lot of stuff in order to be able to think about it. And like you say, it almost should go without saying, but it, I think that it did need to be said. You know, there were people around the time who were saying, we don't need to teach knowledge to kids. They can just, they can just Google it. They've got a really powerful computer in their pockets. They can just Google information. And lots of people thought that. And so there's been this, this hard swing the other way in this, this sort of rise of neo-traditionalism, if you like, mm. of people sort of talking about the importance of knowledge and memory and retrieval practice. Um, and I know that your forthcoming book addresses this, this head on. I don't know how much you want to say about it. This is coming out in the spring term. Would you like to just give a little bit to foreshadow um, what this book is about? And then we'll move on to the, to the conversation um, that I have planned. Yes, it's very much. I, I, it's going to be called The Future of Learning and the Myths that Hold It Back. Um, and it's really an attempt to to reclaim the middle ground, if you like, rather than allowing this, what I call the punch and Judy show between the traditionals and the progressives to keep kind of swinging backwards and forwards, you know, uh, following different fashions that you were just talking about, the pendulum swinging back towards the knowledge rich slash direct instruction um, approach. And, you know, I think we're grown up enough, we're numerous enough to be able to think beyond the number two, aren't we? Beyond either or, beyond knowledge or skills, relevance or rigor, thinking or understanding. It's like, come on, we can do better than that. So this book is an attempt to acknowledge the mistakes, the exaggerations, the hype, the simplifications that characterized, um, have to characterize what you might br broadly call the progressive trend in education. Of course, there have been naiveties and exaggerations and so on, but also to take a long, hard look at the, the opposite extreme, um, which is more in the ascendant at the moment, uh, as you just said, and say, you know, hold on a minute, does this, does this argument, which says, uh, uh, basically, that we know from cognitive science, that the mind, the brain is, or is fundamentally designed, people use the metaphor of architecture, the fundamental architecture of cognition, is such that direct instruction in a knowledge rich curriculum is the only scientifically valid approach to take. And I think that's not true. I'm a cognitive scientist. I have a DPhil in experimental psychology from the University of Oxford. I've written a series of books alongside my education books about the nature of intelligence and about embodied cognition and so on. So I've, you know, I've paid my dues, I've done my time and I've kept my my credentials alive, if you like, um, in terms of like being a fellow of the British Psychological Society, all that kind of thing. So I know a bit, like Paul Kirshner and Daniel Willingham do, 
you know, I know a, quite a fair bit about cognitive science. And the way I read the cognitive science is it absolutely does not provide a copper-bottomed mandate for a neo-traditional approach to education. So I take issue with that reading uh, of the science in the book and try and in the service, not of just, you know, knocking people who've promoted that view, but in terms of, of re re-acknowledging, re-owning the complexity of teaching and the complexity of teaching that lives in the middle ground between the extremes of progressivism and the extremes of traditionalism. And I, I hope we'll, you and I will have another opportunity to talk in more detail about some of that critical work which I've been doing uh, m most recently, but maybe that's enough for now. Yeah, thank you. And I absolutely would welcome that. I'd love to have you back on to talk about the book in more detail when it comes out. Um, it is a sensational read. As I remember reading it and thinking that it should come with a box of popcorn or a box of fireworks <laughs> or something because it was just, it's fantastic. And it was, it's so informative and sort of forensic in the way that you sort of critique this, this neo-traditional, what's increasingly an orthodoxy. Um, as it's reflected in the, you know, in the new Ofsted framework, in changes to the curriculum, in changes mm. to exams, and increasingly in classroom practice, teachers are really taking this to heart, um, and, and on good faith, and you know, with 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 like you say, with the best with the best wishes for their for their uh, students in sure. mind. Of course, there are no um, villains here. There, of course not. Um, but I, I, and I think that it's appealing neo-traditionalist thinking because it sells this sort of deceptively simple story that knowledge is foundational and therefore we have to change nothing about what we're doing. In fact, we only need to double down on teaching subject knowledge and all will be well. And I just sort of think if only it were true, you know, like I, I, I would love for that to be true because complicated like, education <laughs> is a complicated business and it's a mixture of as you write in that book you talk about it's a very complicated mixture of values and beliefs and science and ideas about what we think education is for and ideas about what constitutes you know what it means to be human to be fully sure. human what it means to to, to become a, a fully fledged uh, human being yeah um and so i i'm really looking forward to that book coming out and to continuing that story nearer the time um, Great. Yeah, Matt, me too. I'll, I'll look forward to, uh, to having another um, long and invigorating conversation with you about it. So, as you know, the format of this podcast is that it sort of comes in two parts. I want to start firstly with the guest and to understand what, what your values are and what you think education is all about. And then we'll move on to, um, to the rethinking education part of the conversation. So to start with, I'd like you to take you back to your early life and to your own childhood, your own experience of school and education more widely. Mm. Uh well, I was born and brought up for the first eight and a half years of my life in North London, in Finchley, Margaret Thatcher's constituency, um, and went to a, a little primary school there, which, interestingly, I was invited back to, to do some sessions on building learning power uh, a little while ago, and to discover that the school had been burnt down uh, and rebuilt since since my day. Wow. But luckily, the the, the only bit of the building that, that, that didn't, um, what that wasn't consumed in the fire was the head head teacher's office and his or her toilet. And luckily, the old records, the archives, were stored in uh, his toilet. <laughs> uh, and they remained. So I was able to look at the ledger, the date, the 5th of September 1953, when little Guy Claxton, aged five, entered Frith Manor Primary School wow. <laughs> in North Finchley, and even and my appearance in the punishment book as well. Really? <laughs> yeah. So that was that was where I started, um, and then uh, my parents moved to rural on the borders of Worcestershire and Shropshire, uh, and I <clears throat> spent an unhappy two terms in the little local primary school because I spoke funny 
um, and I was a newcomer and I wasn't versed in the ways of rough, rough country kids, as many of them were. Um, and then I was rescued and sent off to be a boarder at King's School in Worcester, uh, what was then a direct grant school. Um, and there spent the next almost 10 years of my life from <coughs> about eight and a half until um, till 18, uh, boarding there. And uh, I mean, of course, there was deep emotional damage, which I've done some therapeutic work to try and um, understand. Uh, uh, because of boarding? Yeah, yeah, because of the boarding. It's like when you're eight and you're a rather dependent and weedy kid, which I was, um, it's bound to be, it can't not be fairly tra traumatic. Um, and yet I never experienced it as traumatic. So I was always puzzled by what I'd done with my emotions, even before I was sent away, in quotes, to the school, which meant that I sort of sucked it up. You know, I wasn't as miserable as any eight year old had a right to be. Um, and it's very interesting there. I've, there are some some very interesting recent books about the effects of boarding. Um, there's one I'm trying to remember the names of the titles. There's one called Posh Boys um, and another called a very good book by a psychotherapist called The Making of Them by Nick Dufel which spoke volumes to me about my own experience and the way in which one's emotional development has necessarily to become somewhat perverted in order to cope with this peculiar situation. Um, and there's a lot more that one could say about the way in which people who've come out, particularly little boys who were sent into that system, as I was, uh, the way in which many of them have come out as clever and charming, but callow and shallow adults, um, which I think I was. I think I reflected that for some period of time until I became interested in my own learning defined much more broadly than school and university. Right. OK. Um, and then you said when we spoke yesterday that you said that you you uh, performed unexpectedly well in your GCSEs and that this sent yeah, you off on a, on a journey. O-levels, please. I beg your pardon. O-levels. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Is that what the O stands for? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> old levels. Um, yes, that was a that was a formative. You asked about sort of significant, you know, what moments in my life that sort of steered me. And I was when I was when I was at King's School up until about up until O level, I wasn't very good at anything really. I was a sort of pleasant kid. I didn't get into much trouble, but I wasn't good at schoolwork, and I wasn't good at leadership. I was never I was never going to be a sort of prefect or a monitor. I wasn't good at girls. It was a single sex school, but there was a girls school down the high street in Worcester that we had a lot of interest in. And I wasn't very good on that front either. But when I when I got my O level results, I think everybody, my mom and my dad and my teachers were rather sort of astonished at how well I'd done. And I think that caused a sort of seismic shift in me. And so it's at some completely unconscious level, there was something in when went, oh, you could be good at this, then you could be good at scholarship you might say or at, at that kind of at being good at school so then i think you know what happened was as a result of that sort of shift in what psychologists there's an interesting notion in psychology people talk about the idea of possible selves which i like that concept very much and a big part of growing up is shaping your your suite your portfolio of possible selves what is it what is it sort of acceptable to me to wish for about myself to become? You know, and traditionally we think about those things in gendered terms, you know. In, traditionally, you know, it's like the possible self of being an engineer was not often available to girls because there was a steering going on um, against that. 
But I think this opened up a possible self for me, which I hadn't really thought that I could be really brainy before. Um, and that then unleashed, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? That then unleashed a willingness to commit, to think, to study more assiduously. You know, that was what made the difference. But it was, as it were, I needed that permission. I needed that switch to be switched on, to say it's worth it. It's a sort of growth mindset-y kind of stuff in a way. I hadn't thought about that before. But to, but to say, you know, it's worth putting in the effort. So I did, and uh, and I got to Cambridge um, to read natural sciences. I was going to be a, I was a, inclined, a big part of me was inclined towards the sciences, and another part of me was inclined to inclined towards jazz and drama. Um, I spent a lot of time being involved in the school plays and playing my trumpet in different forms. Um, but uh, I, academically, I was I was self steering more towards the sciences. So I went to Cambridge with the intention of um, at Cambridge, you had to do something called the natural sciences tripos. You can't just go and read chemistry, which is what I would have done if I'd gone to Oxford or anywhere else. But Cambridge, God bless it. You know, it's like immersed you in a whole lot of things that you'd never um that were kind of a, around you know you had to do the whole thing tripos is this funny word so when i got there you know i had a chat with the with the tutor that who was assigned to me um and he said sort of well what would you like to do for my first year subjects and we had a chat about it and i ended up doing cell biology physiology chemistry and maths i'd never done any bi biology in my life before i'd never did, I've not, I've done o level biology but the ethos at, at Cambridge at that time was if you're bright enough to get to Cambridge, you're bright enough to pick it up, which was incredible. So I, and I just loved the physiology and the cell biology, um, but I didn't love the maths and I didn't love the chemistry. And when I went on into the second year, you had to choose different subjects. So I had to do double chemistry because that's what I was. That was my main track. That's what I was going to major on in the third year. But you had to do another pick another subject that you hadn't done in the first year and i chose experimental psychology and at the end of the second year uh, the second year exams are called part 1b in the curious language of cambridge um so i was doing two dollops of chemistry and one dollop of experimental psychology and the results i got were i got a very poor 2-2 two -two overall in the two dollops of chemistry i got a first overall in the exams in psychology in the psychology exams and, and when they when those marks were aggregated i got a first overall wow so i must have i took to psychology <laughs> like a doctor water it's like like a doctor water it's like you know I'm, I'm my psychology exam must have been shit hot mustn't it in <laughs> you really nailed that yeah <laughs> so <clears throat> in, in <clears throat> much to my mother's disappointment I didn't go on. I managed to squeeze my way onto the third year psychology course um, and then got a first in that at the end and then went on to do a doctorate in psychology at Oxford, where my girlfriend from back home was studying, also studying psychology. And it wasn't until then, if I can jump forward a little bit, <clears throat> when I think back about, I mean, the shift for, into psychology <clears throat> for me was about being liberated to think rather than just to have to learn in the old fashioned sense of the word learn. The chemistry I was studying was coming at me so thick and fast, I, I, I had no way of comprehending it. So all I had to try and do was just literally mug it up. And I was no good at that. Um, so it was that second year at Cambridge was quite miserable for me in the chemistry and delightful at me because you could write essays, you could have opinions, you could weigh things up. Things were not cut and dry. They were not black and white. Uh, and I must have, I must have, something in me must have taken to that, as I say, like a, like, like a duck to water. So then, I, then I went on that. So that was kind of part of what steered me. If you like, I enjoyed being a thinker and a, a ponderer and an arguer and that bit of my character was shaped and then when i wanted to, went on to oxford the the 
um, approach to supervision, doing a PhD at Oxford, doing a DPhil at Oxford in those days, was extremely laissez-faire. I was billeted in a room with three other young bloods, and we basically self-taught. You know, when I, I, I was never asked to go and see my supervisor. Very occasionally, we would meet in the coffee area, and he'd say, well, do you think it's time for a supervision? And I'd say, well, perhaps it is. And I'd go, and basically what they would say was, well, so what have you been doing? And I would talk about all the kind of random experiments that Nig and Rog and Steve and I had been cooking up for ourselves. And he would say, that was my supervisor. He both had a he and a she uh, at various points. Uh, they would say, well, that all sounds very interesting. So what do you think you're doing next? Um, and that was about all the direction that I got. So as well as coming out eventually with a, D, with a PhD, I think what I got at Oxford was an extended apprenticeship in learning to think for myself, in de-automatizing myself, in undoing that being a good schoolboy, that learning to be taught, and I think, without ever conceptualizing it in these terms, it was an exciting and, and sometimes quite challenging apprenticeship in learning to learn, in that being autodidactic, to use the, the use the term that you you used. And we all did very well. You know, that was great. It wasn't so great when it came to submitting my D film, because I had two very auspicious examiners, one of whom was Jerome Bruner, a great figure in the history of both education and psychology but they didn't like it because they didn't like my defil because of this lack of supervision and the amount of freedom that we had in an informal conversation with jerry bruner afterwards he said well it was very interesting guy but reading your defil was like reading a piece of work by someone who was trying to make a string vest hold water <laughs> ouch <laughs> ouch yes so i had to spend the next nine months uh rewriting it and, ev and e eventually got it during that period my first marriage to the to the girl back home broke up and so it was quite a traumatic time for me so i'd learned to think more independently but now comes a phase of my life where i'm learning where my sense of learning now becomes more personal and deeper and at that time, um, I, another formative experience for me was was coming. Someone recommended to me a book by a man called Carl Rogers, called "On Becoming a Person." Indeed, yes. And Rogers was um, the, a big influence in my own thinking, and then the reason why I, I'm so keen to talk to people in these interviews about this idea of significant learning, which he defined as, you know, learning that changes the behavior of the individual or changes the trajectory of their life or the way that they see themselves in some way. Um, and I know when we spoke yesterday, you said that actually discovering Roger's book on becoming a person was itself a moment of significant learning for you. It was extraordinary. You know, again, when, you know, when I look back, or actually even at the time, I'd been studying and performing very well in the world of psychology for seven years before I read a book that spoke to me as a person. And it was about on becoming a person. Roger's writing, clear, lucid, profound, spoke to me in the middle of this muddle of emotions with having my defil turned down and the breakup of my marriage and going into counseling um, my wife, that my then wife, my ex-wife, um, we went together for one session, but after that she said, I'm not coming anymore. As far as I'm concerned, it's over. I don't want to do this. But I carried on with a wonderful woman called Leona Snow, who has worked in what's now called Relate, what was then called the Marriage Guidance Council. Um, and she went on to become a, a friend and a mentor of mine. But the idea that she she was able to sit for an hour and... This is the way I thought about it afterwards, and taught me by her own calm and meticulous attention and her empathy for me. She taught me to construe my emotional world not as deeply fractured and threatening, which is the way I had been experiencing it, but as interesting. 
And so this then opened up another whole domain of learning. And I went off into all kinds of, this is the 1970s, where all kinds of interesting, wild and wacky things called the EST training and encounter groups, all kinds of human development work was going on informally uh, in London. And I moved, I got a job in London, I moved to London and became very immersed in this world of my own personal development. It was like emotional boot camp for me. Um, and it was all sparked by these sessions with the wonderful Leona Snow, who I uh, sought out just a, a, a few years ago in order to, to re-meet. We had lunch and, and I told her what a profound impact she had had, not just on helping me recover from the breakdown of my marriage, but on steering the course of my life. And that was very formative for me because it it opened my sense of what psychology was about from being purely intellectual. I mean, that was the, the, the Oxford and Cambridge psychology was all about memory and decision making and problem solving. It was highly intellectualized. And now I saw that it that it could be that, but it could be so much more than that. And actually the intellect, the life, my life, the life of my intellect and the life of the intellect took on a totally different quality when you saw it in that larger context of the life of the body and the life of emotions and the life of relationships and so on. So I became a more, um, I continued in psychology, but I became a more rounded, I would like to say, a more inclusive kind of psychology. So my interest in learning persisted. But now, and to this day, my sense of learning is, and this is what's driven a lot of my work in education, is so much broader than the, the formal content of the curriculum as transacted in classrooms. Yes, it is that. And it's much more than that. Yes. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. And so you say that you, you moved to London around that time. Is that because you, you worked at the Institute of Education? Yeah, towards the end of the, of the year, 1974, when I was rewriting my thesis, I got interested in education. Oh, I'll tell you what happened. I forgot to mention this to you yesterday. I was so bored with, re, with rewriting this damn defil. I just wanted it off my back that I had to find displacement activities for myself. And one of them was I met a man called Dennis Gell at a party somewhere or other. Uh, and he ran what in the language of the time was called a tutorial center for maladjusted primary children. That was the language in a, in a town called Whitney, which is not far from Oxford. And I got, had a very interesting conversation with him at the end of which he said, well, would you like to come and, you know, if you would like to, you could come and volunteer. Uh, and I did. So while I was supposed to be rewriting my defil, Tuesday and Thursday mornings, I would hop on my pink Tiger, Triumph Tiger 100 motorbike and motorbike out to Whitney and be in the room with these kids, the malad kids, as they were called in the, the language of the time, and learnt, you know, learnt again was learning about the 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 emotional the turbulent the behavioral world of education and not just the intellectual world of of education and at the same time i was also going to some seminars in oxford about education and some kind of radical approaches to education so when i started looking for a job it was actually a toss-up between getting a lectureship at the university of urbana champaign in illinois which I was interviewed for and nearly got and was pipped at the post for that and taking a part-time three-year part-time lectureship in the psychology of education at the Institute of Education in London and you know had I gone to Illinois my life would have been extremely diff different I would have stayed in the intellectual psychology world I imagine and I would have you know hope with all if all had gone well I'd have become a you know professor and a, uh, an expert on something or other in that world. But no, I went to the Institute of Education and then was thrown into the world of the messy world of education and PGCE students. 
And that shaped me into thinking, actually, I, I, I realized I loved being in that world of practical, messy relevance rather than the world of clinical, surgical, micro-experimental sessions, teasing little theoretical distinctions apart. I still like that. I still am involved with that. And I still drop in sometimes on meetings of what's called the Experimental Psychology Society, which is the hard line, which is what you know, what used to be my constituency. You know, my 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 old friend, Alan Baddeley, with whom, whom I meet up with from time to time, and he's very interested in education. Yeah. Uh, but also founder of the idea of working memory and short -term, Indeed, yeah. short, short, short term memory. And John Morton, various other people who are now fellows of the Royal Society. I still enjoy dipping into that world, but I also enjoy that I that I, this is not my place. So, you know, then I became more and more interested in education and my concept of learning and, and then of learning to learn, of the possibility of getting better at learning, which was sort of heretical. It sort of kind of it didn't really compute at the time. But I was reading stuff about, you know, alternative forms of education which were promoting that that kind of idea. Some of Jerry Bruner's work um, himself uh, was very formative uh, in those times. So I never looked back, really. That three-year uh, lectureship got turned into a permanent post. And then I moved to Chelsea College, Centre for Science and Maths Education. That was then, Chelsea College was then subsumed by King's College. Uh, and I moved to King's College for a little while. And then that's that's where my academic home is now. I went back to King's College after I retired. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of progressed, became more and more interested in and identified with this world of learning to learn. Yes. Um, and so it, it sounds like something really interesting happened around that time where you, when we spoke yesterday, you said that it felt like your life sort of split into two, where you were working at the Institute and you had this sort of this job in experimental psychology still, and, or in, in more about applied psychology, I mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, but also you were, you were, you know, going to these encounter groups and, mm. in, you know, engaging in some um, countercultural sort of uh, activities in the sense of, you know, just like um, exploring you know, weird and wonderful aspects of psychology and human development. And weird and wonderful aspects of myself as well. In, indeed, yes, <laughs> yes. And um, and I know that um, Buddhism was also, became a big part of your life. Was that around that time as well? It was a little bit later than that. Um, I became, personally, I became very, very involved in this, having moved to London, into this world of personal development um uh, of group group sessions groups of sort of psychotherapy but it was much more of a kind of free for all um and i started working with someone who i'd met in oxford a man called alan lowen uh, had also been a psychology research student but had kind of jumped ship and gone to california and uh, did a summer school with carl rogers who carl rogers was one of the originators of a technique called encounter groups which are basically leadership groups where a group of people get together and sit around with no agenda and wait to see what emerges. And it's extremely uncomfortable, particularly at the beginning where people are looking for some leadership uh, and so on. But what emerges are all kinds of um, buried you know, habits and patterns, ways of interacting, things that you dislike in other people things that you don't dislike about yourself, things that other people dislike about you. So it was like I went into a world of a kind of emotional boot camp, really, which was being led by this guy, Alan Lowen, and, and a whole bunch of other people. And then these leaders, these rather charismatic leaders, one by one, they started disappearing to India and coming back wearing, wearing orange clothes and having funny names and wearing a little necklace with an old geezer with a long straggly beard. Um, actually, he wasn't that old, but he looked like an old geezer, little picture in this in this locket, uh, and changing their name. And I thought that, uh, I, you know, I admire these people, this is doing me good, but I'm never going to go there. And then in the middle of one of these sessions, 
um, I had a sort of transformative experience where this guy, this guru, who in those days it was known as Bhagwan, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, um, was giving a lecture about Carl Rogers. About, I thought, well, wow, you know, here's this Eastern mystic, and he knows all about the stuff that I know about. But in that lecture, it's like he un, it's like he was cracking open what Carl Rogers had, un, had had discovered and understood, and took it to a whole other level. The beauty of his discourse, of his prose, in that context, blew me away. And before I knew what I'd done, it like a bit of me, kind of took the reins and I signed up to become one of these sannyasins. So for the next seven years, whilst I was working mainly at Chelsea College, the, the Center for Science and Magic, uh, Science and Maths Education, I was no longer Dr. Guy Claxton, but I was Swami Anand Ageha. And I had tried with varying degrees of failure to get people to use that name for me and wore orange or ochre style clothes, not not robes, but the style, and wore the necklace. And uh, that's that's who I was. And it was quite challenging. It was quite confronting um, being uh, so out like that, uh, if you like. And that was a period of my life that lasted for about seven years. And then that was enough. It was quite intense and quite dramatic being, being involved in that world. And I went to P Pune where Bhagwan lived and spent some time living there. And it was extremely informative, extremely valuable. People have all kinds of opinions about the, the world that Rajneesh created. There's even a six part serial on Netflix called Wild Wild Country, which is all about the world that I inhabit, the world around Bhagwan, which I inhabited. And there are all kinds of questions that we can raise about that. But for me, my personal story was it did me nothing but good. And when it came to the end, when I wanted to move out of that sort of white water rafting period of my life, uh, I left with no recriminations and no difficulties and moved into something stiller and deeper, which was represented for me by the world of Buddhism and uh, Buddhist meditation, what, what's come to be called mindfulness, but basically Vipassana uh, meditation. And that's continued with me um, up to the present day. Yes, right. No, that's fascinating. And I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely um, a, a keen meditator myself. Um, I came to it fairly late in my life, but I can really see the, the benefit of these of these practices, which is so simple. And even just sort of 10 minutes a day can just totally reframe the whole day. Um, and and I also, as part of my learning to learn um, curriculum that we ran in, in the school that I was working in, we also we brought in, first of all, guided visualizations mm. and then some sort of mindfulness of breathing type meditations. Um, and I know that it's a it's, it's sort of a, quite a complex picture, the the extent to which meditation has been has been studied in schools because like everything that's done in schools, everything gets looked at through the lens of does it improve exam results? which anybody who meditates would, I think, find quite a laughable idea that, that this is something that's, you know, intended to improve your cognitive performance in some exam. The fact that meditation has been practiced widely, as far as I know, in, in every single major religion has had has had offshoots where meditation has been taken really, really seriously for thousands of years. You know, there is obviously uh something to this <laughs> to say the least um and i'm really interested in in to come to come back to learning to learn in developing and i know you are as well in developing something that's much more rounded than something that's just about you know retrieval practice and sticking information into your long-term memory there's something about being human here that's about sort of you know things like spending time in nature and being able to observe it seems to me that, that when I talk about metacognition and self-regulation, I define them as metacognition is monitoring and controlling your thought processes. So sort of monitoring and controlling your internal mental, um, you know, um, yeah. process. And then self-regulation is monitoring and controlling your emotions and behaviors. So that's sort of about how you interact with the external environment. And they're obviously sort of mirror, mirror, mirror images of each other, these ideas of monitoring and control. 
but it also seems to me that that's a really that those two processes are essentially what meditation is about it's largely about monitoring and through monitoring and just noticing and paying attention and learning how to be present you start to find out where the levers are and where you can sort of start to take steps mentally and emotionally and you know behaviorally to to exercise more control over your life um, and I'm very interested in in exploring the role of, of, of this side of of um, of education. Um, and I know that you are as well. You, you, you had some links with. So in Brighton, there's a Buddhist school called the Dharma School. I know you had some links there for a while. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we're in deep territory now, which 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 you and I both share. Um, I see. Buddhism for me is not a religion. It's it's the deepest kind of psychology I know. And it's particularly a psychology of, you know, why people fuck up. Why people fuck up against their best interests. Why do I end up sometimes feeling miserable and locked into myself and not being able to say what I want or what I mean to my wife? Why do people behave in ways that stop them being the person that they like themselves best for being. And that's a lot to do with with unlearning. It's a lot to do with being inquisitive, like developing an inquisitive mindset, but turning, it's like being inquisitive in a mirror. So instead of being inquisitive about, you know, the animals or grass or molecules or something, it's like you look at a mirror and learning to be interested in what's going on, what's shaped you, what's behind the way you function and the way you don't function. So for me, the whole Buddhist endeavor really is it's like a sort of deep self-organized psychotherapy in terms of, you know, learning to free up things like, you know, as in ordinary therapy, you know, a lot of people go to therapy because they're experiencing thoughts or doing things that, that lead them to believe that they're a bad person, that they're worthless or unlovable or something like that. And some of the things, many of the things that they may be doing are sort of trivial. You know, they're not worth that degree of, of censure, but there's something goes on inside us which escalates the judgments around whatever it may be. And so, you know, people talk about the kind of you know, the, the spiral into depression where, you know, you forget your mother's birthday. But instead of just ringing her up and saying, oh, I'm terribly sorry, mum, you know, let me let's, you know, what, what should we do? Let's go to the theatre or uh, whatever it might be. You start going into there you are. You see, I've done it again. I'm always going to be like this. No wonder people don't like me very much. And before you know it, within 10 seconds, you've disappeared down the plug hole of depression. You know, there's a, a, a small fuck up, which, you, which some kind of unwanted, unnecessary, unhealthy psychological process, some bit of malware has got into your mind, which turns that into an existential disaster, which it then takes you a month to recover from. You know, and that for me, that's the sort of prototype. So when we get into that kind of territory, it's think, you know, we need to a part of what you was your lead into this, James, was just reminding me, reminding us that education is a fundamentally moral business. It's not a technical business. It's like, what do we want young people to be like? What's it? What's this all for? Where are we heading? You can't finesse that, although the contemporary impulse is to do precisely that, is to treat education as if it were merely a technical business of getting better grades and getting more kids to high quality universities. Right. But actually, I wrote a whole book about this called What's the Point of School? Right. Which is, you know, it's like you can't start thinking about education unless you start from clarity about when kids are 18, what do we want them to know to, our, to the best of our ability? What's going to prepare them best for a future which we cannot predict? We can't even predict what kind of technology we're going to be using in five years' time, let alone 35 years' time. 
what kind of things do they need to know what kind of things do they need to be able to do and what kinds of people what kind of dispositions or character traits or what kind of attitudes to the best of our ability will set them up well for being able to cope with a world that is complex and uncertain and challenging and changing which is the fundamental buddhist question also it's like how do i live a good life in such a world so if we don't start from that sense of morality so we right from the beginning we have to include what do we want kids to be like are we happy if they come out of school passive timid docile compliant are we happy if they come out glib smug arrogant and combative are we happy with that are we happy if they come out defeated aggressive helpless and lost are we happy with that so i don't see how as a responsible society we can engage in a to, to talk about education if we don't engage in that kind of talk if we reduce it to mere technicalities of exams and assessment formats and whether we teach dryden or jk rowling it's like we're, we're lost we've lost the depth we've lost the heart of the whole matter I could not agree more. Um, absolutely, you know, I think that we do lose sight of the moral purpose of education. And it, it's, it's not so much that it, we lose sight of it, it's, it's that it's just, it doesn't seem to be up for discussion. You know, I'm very sort of engaged and involved in the sort of the ongoing education debate and have been for the last sort of, probably the last eight years in a f almost daily level, you know, like following the, the debates that teachers and education researchers and others are involved in. Um, and it seems like increasingly lots of the conversation is just around essentially the sharing of best practice as defined by how to improve exam results. And that's what that's what teachers themselves are, are um, engaged in. And that's that's all to the good. But it feels like some of these wider questions, the moral questions, um that um that are at play here and one of the things that you know that you mentioned there is just you, that you didn't mention in that list but is one that i know that um animates us both is just do we want do we want to have a system that turns out kids who have been branded failures mm. you know why do we even need to have a pass and fail mark um but to just to just to step back a little bit the when when you were talking about you know about you know providing young people with the sort of with the mental in a sense like a mental technology to understand why it is that people mess things up mm. and and why it is that you know um that some lives go down down really really um you know well-worn paths and it, and they, oh, sometimes they don't just last a month but it's like it just derails your whole life yes absolutely you know, my my sort of the, my entrance into thinking about education came through through a weird avenue where i was working as a typist as temping as a typist at the probation service um and it was my job to type up pre-sentence reports so when when somebody's committed a crime in this case in my case it was like low level stuff like stealing stuff from shops like repeat offenders shoplifting um, they'd have an interview with a probation officer and then the probation officer writes up a pre-sentence report that they send to the judge to inform sentencing. Mm -hmm. And it was my job to type up these pre-sentence reports. And so over a period of, of a few months that I was there, I just had this insight into hundreds of people's lives whose lives had, had just gone off the rails. And, yeah. would, and it's, it felt like there was a clear pattern that emerged out of all of these lives that I, that I read about where people, you know, would have started out in life, they were generally quite young people in their sort of 20s to 30s who had, you know, normal stuff. They had, you know, a job or a flat or a partner or some kids or something. And then it felt like something bad happened, not in every case, but in almost all of these cases, something bad happened, something sort of unexpectedly bad. The stuff that life deals every, every one of us at some point, somebody dies, somebody gets ill, somebody takes their own life, somebody loses their own job, whatever it might be, there's like an infidelity, say. And then there was a complete like inability to cope with that, with that difficult you know, hand that life had dealt them. And like you say, you talked about the spiral into depression and the spiral into substance misuse, which often, mm, you know, mm. people get addicted to things. They yep. lose their friendships, their relationships fall apart. They haven't got any money and they end up, you know, stealing stuff from shops. And there were there were hundreds and hundreds of people in my city alone who, whose lives sort of followed this template. And I remember sort of thinking at the time, 
all of these people, like some of them had really difficult childhoods. Some of them had really, really difficult lives and they were dealt a difficult hand at birth. You know, it was just they had they were up against it from the outset. But all, almost all of them certainly went through the education system. And I started wondering, like, to what extent does education set up young people to be able to deal with the vicissitudes of life, you know, which, like I yep. say, come, come to us all. Yep. And, it, and it just increasingly sort of became my belief, and, and I still believe this, that education, not only does it not um, do a very good job at setting people up for dealing with those, those you know, difficulties that life throws at us, but actually that it compounds those difficulties sometimes, and in particular by re- repeatedly and, and uh, insistently labelling young people as failures. Um, it just seems to me that that's deeply wrong and it is a moral business and it's something that I, you know, people sometimes, um, you use the word, why do you hate children? You often see people sort of saying this on Twitter in, in a joking way. You know, somebody says, I believe in strict behavior management and they think somebody else will joke, oh, why do you hate children? You know, as a sort of joking mm. thing. And I think that some people, you know, they, they, they use that jokingly because some people have used that in earnest. Um but I think that wanting to conserve a system that fails one third of children by design uh, is hateful. I hate it with every fiber of my being. I don't see that this is OK. Yeah. Um, and some of the most inspirational head teachers and teachers that I know, they burn with this sense of, of moral purpose. You know, I know a really amazing head teacher in London who I hope will come on the show soon who says, you know, if people don't get angry in the interview about social injustice and inequality, then she doesn't employ them because she's like, you're not paying attention if you're not angry about about what we're seeing here. Um, So I absolutely welcome what you were just saying. I think that it's absolutely vital. So to bring this back to, you know, what can we do in terms of classroom practice and as teachers and educators to address this agenda? Because I'm not suggesting that teachers need to become therapists here and to sort of to start to unpick, you know, what's going on in in maladjusted, you know, young people. Mm. Um, But for example, just to give one example of something that we did in the learning skills curriculum was to use learning journals. So we had one lesson a fortnight. The children were writing in learning journals and Often that was about sort of learning itself. And the que- they, they were asked, they were responding to a series of prompt questions like, "How's it going for you this week? What's going well for you? What what are you struggling with?" Or sometimes it might focus on a particular subject. What's it look like when you're doing really well in maths? What does it feel like when math is really difficult? You know, and so on. So we started mm-hmm. to. It was essentially about transfer, about trying to get them to transfer their their vocabulary and their thinking about how they learn in different contexts. But we also did, you know, um, some aspects of sort of autobiographical writing, which there's uh, incredible. I'm sure you're familiar with some of the research on this, like James Pennebaker and others have written mm. some really, really fascinating um, research about the, the power that autobiographical writing can have on so many aspects of people's lives, including health outcomes. Um so one one example, you know, for anti-bullying week, there's this guy called the scary guy who's um, like a, an ex-biker dude and a sort of tattooist, and his face is completely covered in tattoos, and he just he looks terrifying. Um, and he had this sort of epiphany at some point along his in, along his life that he he was this contorted sort of you know um, gargoyle of of hate, and he he thought I need to 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 change paths, and so he became this incredibly empathic very entertaining, amusing um, guy who goes around schools and does work with schools around anti-bullying. And he sort of says that, oh, you know, right. you've got to stop passing the hate on. And he does this thing called a seven-day challenge where you have to go seven days and seven nights without saying anything negative about another human being. Uh, and so we, we did this challenge with my year sevens and they had to write about it in their learning journals. And it was absolutely fascinating because they would, you know... These were kids who wouldn't say boo to a goose, you know, those year sevens who are still sort of, you know, everything's perfect and, you know, they're all really neat and tidy and they've got all their stationery and so on. Um, And you think, you know, these kids aren't going to struggle. And they were all crumbling within a day. They were like, I can't not be mean to my little brother or sister or to my auntie who always winds me up or whatever it was. It was absolutely fascinating. And then as the week progressed, they would start to talk about strategies or we started to talk in lessons about strategies. What can you do if you can feel yourself getting wound up? 
what can you do? And so they started talking about, you know, killing somebody with kindness and saying, you know, I can say, tell that my brother's going to be in a bad mood. So I'd say, can I get you a drink? Or, oh, your hair looks really nice today, say. Or they would just go upstairs and sort of scream into a pillow or whatever it was. So they started <laughs> to develop this ability to regulate, just to, again, monitoring and control. They monitor what's going on internally within themselves and externally in others. And they develop a much more sort of sophisticated way of, of, of relating to other people. Um, and these are profoundly important ideas. You know, if, if we can if we can get some people to just have that little pause for thought, young people, and to think about how they how what their trigger points are, what their buttons are, and how they can learn how to not allow themselves to be triggered or to allow other people to press their buttons and to elicit certain reactions from them. Mm. Even just that as a, as a small thing, and, and autobiographical writing, there's a lot more to it than that. But I think that we can do things like this in schools that can have a profound impact. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that could bring us back to mindfulness that we were talking about a little while ago, James, because one of the one of the benefits, one of the immediate practical benefits of mindfulness is it builds your capacity to wake up and realize what you're doing or what you're about to do and gives you a glimmer of an opportunity to choose to do something different. In other words, you have that moment of awareness, of self-awareness, where I could make this situation worse by, the, you know, the snappy comeback or whatever it might be. But uh, exactly as you were saying with these kids through the writing, but not there's a sort of there's a concept in Theravadan Buddhism that they call patient pausing, which I think is a very nice idea and, and incredibly practical. It's like, you know, isn't that useful just to have that moment of coming to and saying, I was about to say something really unkind and unpleasant to somebody I love. Is that really what I want to do? You know, and then you know, and sometimes you go on and say it anyway, because you can't stop yourself. It's not it's not, you know, it's not a sure fire, but it gives you increasingly it gives you that option to to choose the more the buddhist word would be more skillful path rather than the path where you know you wound yourself just as much as you will probably more than you wound the other person unless you're the kind of person who has become so opaque to themselves that they could they that they can no longer feel when they've let themselves down in terms of their values that like they're not in touch with that anymore like maybe scary guy before he had his epiphany just had no sense of sort of shame or or personal responsibility even it's like you know i've just made a reasonably unfortunate situation a huge amount worse by saying something stupid now what could i do to not do that so much one thing I wanted to say, one of the things I, I touch on in the new book, The Future of Teaching, is the confusion that some of the neo-traditionalists have between these kind of deep, uh, beginning to address these kind of deeper levels of the person within the context of education and therapy. So there are people who push back against you know, emotional, the ideas of emotional intelligence, because they think that this is somehow treating everybody as damaged and fragile. And uh, it's sort of infantilizing. Now, there's, a, of course, there's a grain of truth in that we all know about the snowflake generation and, and anti what's that where you don't anti platforming or whatever it's called, you know, where you can't bear to hear anybody say anything that might offend you. And all that kind of thing. But what you and I are talking about is not treating people as pathologized. It's about understanding the pervasive potential for self pathology that we all possess, and being more intelligent about how to deal with that, how to guard against that, and how to work with ourselves so that we loosen up that tightness in our being which makes us you know just if someone catches our eye 
you know, some people might go, who are you looking at? Right? It's like even that, even a moment of eye contact can produce an aggressive response in people or out comes a knife or, you know, well, she was dissing me or whatever. That degree of kind of inability to to do the smart thing rather than do the most primitive impulsive thing it's like this should be the province of education it's not just the province of counseling or the therapeutic room there may be people and i myself have been one for whom that kind of special remedial situation is transiently appropriate but that's not what we're talking about here we're talking about education as something that addresses people's inability to live the good life to go back to a carl rogers expression you know and to be self-sabotaging i don't think that's turning people into snowflakes i think that's like exactly as you were talking about your autobiographical writing that's helping people to gain a bit of awareness a bit of understanding a bit of self-regulation which enables their lives as they would wish them to be led to go more smoothly. I can't, I can't see what's wrong with that. So we're starting to talk about positive ideas for education now. So let's move into the rethinking education part of this conversation. And I always like to start it with examples of positive practice. So um, let's talk about that. What do you see that's happening out in the educational world that you think is really good and that we should do more of that, that addresses this, this sort of wider, more holistic agenda that you're, that you're talking about? Well, there, there's lots of schools, you know, some of which I've worked with, some of which my longtime collaborator, Bill Lucas, has worked with through what he calls the uh, Expansive Education Network. Uh, lots of schools that I know of around the world that are, that are genuinely finding ways to inhabit this enriched middle ground between, you know, a self-indulgent, sloppy, liberal approach and a rigorous heartless over intellectualized traditional approach and i think you know what excites me about education is that there are lots of living shining examples of schools that prove that you can do both you can have both right it's like the holy grail isn't it we can work at the level of helping kids build their self-awareness their self-understanding their kindness, their sense of self-regulation. And at the same time, in the same lesson, we can be helping them learn how to add fractions or to understand the difference between ionic and covalent bonding. There is no necessary conflict between those two things. These are like layers of learning that can go on simultaneously in a classroom rather than a tug of war which competes for time and space in a teacher's uh, teacher's mind, teacher's life. Indeed. And there's a really good metaphor that you use in the new book, and I think that you've used it before, the metaphor of the river, which I find really useful. Would you mind just outlining briefly what that metaphor is and how it relates to these different layers of learning? Sure. I, I, I find it useful. It's like my, you know, I've just used the metaphor of the tug of war, which I think is is a lot of this, you know, the Punch and Judy show, the the conflictual attitude towards the concerns of the progressives and the concerns of the traditionals as if somehow or other you couldn't there was no reconciliation if we're going to do something sloppy called learning to learn that must mean that we no longer care about shakespeare and algebra and all that good stuff so my alternative metaphor which i find useful is a metaphor of a river and a river that has three different layers of learning, if you like, going on at the same time. Sort of on the surface, <coughs> on the surface of the river, there's knowledge and comprehension. Things fairly easy to see, they change relatively fast, they're quite easy to assess. Little packages of stuff come floating down the river. Here's a, here's a package of physics, and now here's a package of 
of the Tudors and here's a package of something else and now we're going to have spend 45 minutes doing PE and all of that kind of stuff. So that, that's one layer of learning. Then a l- little below the surface of the river, there's the, there's the development of skills and expertise, the literacies, numeracies, learning to think like a mathematician, learning to write well, learning to rather than learning that. And things change a little bit more slowly down at that. It's like the, the lower you go in the river, the slower the flow of the river, and also the harder it is to see what's going on down at the bottom of the river. So the second layer is this layer of skills and expertise. And down at the bottom of the river is the is the accumulation of habits and attitudes, the stuff that we've been talking about, the, the, the dispositional level. <clears throat> And that's the, you know, that's the rich stuff that I think we should be paying more attention to. But it's it's slower moving. We are talking about a culture that progressively, relentlessly invites certain habits of mind in young people. It won't happen immediately and it won't happen for all of them because we're human beings and some people you can't get to and some are cussed and do the opposite of what you think. But to create an undercurrent in the classroom, which is pulling people in the direction of becoming more self-organizing, more self-regulating, more inquisitive, more imaginative, more independent, more responsible of their own learning. And that's where the big fish are. And you you probably, like me, you've had the experience of standing on a bridge over a river and looking down into the river and someone saying, oh, look, can you see that big fish? And you can't see it. It's hard to see, particularly the big fish that are lurking around lower down in the river. But if you look for a while and they point out things, you can start to see them. And I think that's what that's what we need to be doing in education. We need to be able to see more clearly the big fish the habit forming fish down the bottom of the river. And I think there are three to match those three levels of learning, which are always there. They're always present. Something's going on down at the bottom of the river, even in a lesson on simultaneous equations. You can't ever just teach simultaneous equations. You're always teaching simultaneous equations plus fear of making mistakes or simultaneous equations plus dependence on the teacher, or simultaneous equations, plus enjoying a challenge and being imaginative and learning how to rescue yourself from difficulty, or, 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 or. There's always something going on down at the bottom of the river, either plus or minus. I sometimes talk about results plus. So results is what's happening at layers one and two, and the plus is what's happening down at the bottom of the river. And as, as a teaching profession, we're not doing something new. We're just bringing into focus. We're learning to see more clearly and address more skillfully what's happening down at the bottom of the river. And so there are these three different skill sets of the teacher that correspond to these three different layers of learning. So one skill set is about knowing your stuff and presenting it in a way that is engaging and age appropriate and (coughs) asking appropriate diagnostic questions, all that good stuff, beloved of the traditionalists, as absolutely appropriate at the level of knowledge acquisition and the development of sound comprehension. At the level of development of skills and expertise, you're more like a sports coach. It's like you're designing activities that gradually stretch those capa- those capacities, like the you know the series of reading books that you work way up, or the series of maths exercises that you work way you wear up. It's graded exercises that gradually build expertise. But down at the bottom of the river, what is it that teachers are doing that influence the growth of the big fish, the big fish of resilience and imagination and intellectual humility? and critical awareness and collaborativeness and all those things that you talk about and I talk about and Ron Berger talks about and lots of other people talk about. And that's to do with the construction of the whole culture of the classroom, the language that we use, the what we put on the walls, how we lay out the furniture, the kinds of activities that we create which build resilience or not, and so on. So so the beacons of hope, of which there are 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds around the world. And I've been privileged to go into some of them in Vietnam and Dubai and Finland and California and Sao Paulo and Auckland and wherever, right? There's lots of this stuff going on where people are doing better by being more conscious and more skillful about what's what they're doing that impacts on the on the bottom level of the river you know so you could go to px school up in i always muddle up doncaster and darlington i think it's doncaster isn't it oh X, yes Doncaster xp school. xp yes xp xp school where they're absolutely doing all those all the layers all the layers at once through complex project work they're an offshoot of something called the expeditionary learning schools that i'm a huge fan of yes that's that ron, Ber ron berger that, isn't it that's ron berger yes who i think is a wonderful uh, he probably the best educator on the planet that i know because he absolutely has this vision which embraces simultaneously we're helping kids to to be more resilient we're helping them to think more independently we're helping them to learn more critically and we're helping them to think like scientists, to think like uh, skilled writers. And all of this is woven together into a highly effective, complex, multi-layered classroom. So you could go to, uh, uh, is it XP or PX school? I forget which. XP. XP. XP school. You could go to Wren Academy in North London. You could go to... Rachel McFarlane is another uh, head teacher who I'm a great fan of, uh, who now runs uh, the education service in Hertfordshire. But the school that she, two, two or three schools, I've known her a long time and admire her tremendously. Um, Walthamstow Girls School and uh, more recently, uh, Isaac the Startup I Arc Academy, Isaac Newton Academy um, in Ilford, uh, way out in, in northeast London. And I could give you dozens and dozens and dozens of schools from my personal experience and many others that I know about or that I've heard about or read about, which are doing this stuff and doing it with difficult kids or with kids from all kinds of backgrounds. I don't think there's any hiding place. I don't think there's any space left for a teacher to say, yes, that's all very well. You could do that in Beaconsfield, but come to Millwall and you wouldn't even dream of trying it. You know, I don't think that bolt hole is available anymore because there are so many examples of teachers who've done it in Millwall or in downtown. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of a, t a town in America, Boise, Idaho, where the, well, there's one uh, one of the iconic um, expeditionary learning schools or in Doncaster in Gwinnamap Harry's wonderful um, XP school, and so on. So the, 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 the positives for me are all the people around the place who are doing it, even given Ofsted, given Michael Gove, given the exam pressures, given COVID, they are doing it. Uh, and the big, problem at, the, pro the big problem for me is, but it's not scaling up fast enough. It's not that, that this possibility, this proven possibility of being able to grow big fish down the bottom of the river at the same time as you're helping kids do well in their GCSEs and enjoy Shakespeare. That it's not, it ought to be, people ought to be shouting this from the rooftops. Um, and some people are, but there's a lot of inertia in the system. There's a lot of like locked up. The system often seems to be impervious to resistant to innovation. And some people are actively disdainful of the kinds of things that, that, we, that we've been talking about. They kind of willfully don't want to get it, it seems, because it's so, you know, there are so many good arguments in favor and so many good proof of concept schools that are actually doing it. Yet somehow or other, they don't seem to want to know about that. They want to retreat into their simplistic silo of knowledge rich slash direct instruction yes 
Yes. And what's interesting, I know that you touch on this in your new book, is that, you know, people often talk to look at schools like Michaela Community School in North London mm. uh, as an example of this sort of, you know, the proof, the proof positive of knowledge rich direct instruction. But if you look at what Michaela are doing, even if they don't acknowledge it, they are very much in the business of developing what you just refer to as epistemic character, yeah. developing these character traits. They talk a lot about kindness there and about, you know, communication yes, and so absolutely. on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just um, looking for the in my bookshelf, the new book, the new Michaela book, which you've probably seen, yeah. which is called The Power of Culture. Uh, in which Catherine Burble Singh absolutely is completely dedicated to the idea that what they're doing is culture building, culture shaping, and that if you're going to do that with kids, many of whom have not developed, for whatever reason, good habits of self-regulation, of politeness, of punctuality, of discipline, of kindness, who haven't been lucky enough to grow up in cultures and families and communities where those beneficial qualities just get osmosed into your being in the matter of everyday life, you have to start by building those. And I, so I'm not against a bit of tough love. I'm not against, you know, zero policy, zero tolerance policy of getting a detention if you've forgotten your pencil case. I think, you know, it's like people used to say, you know, people from tough backgrounds used to say national service was the making of me. You know, it taught me to take responsibility, to show up on time, or that, you know, many of the young people working in Jamie Oliver's 15 kitchen, where he took people, you know, who were almost lost to the system. And there was a lot of tough love there. You know, so I'm, I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'll give Michaela two cheers. I, I don't give them three cheers, because I don't think they build on that foundation enough. I don't think they see that discipline and hard work and remembering what you've been told and being kind and all that kind of stuff. I see that as the launch pad for imagination and adventure and so on. But often, certainly in their writing, um, in their the, the, the Michaela books, you don't get that impression. Yes, and it seems like they're they're in, like you say they're interested in certain character traits, like you were saying about discipline and kindness and punctuality. And there are but there are other character traits, things like the thing, things that you were talking about, like curiosity and entertaining uncertainty. And that's another thing that I think that we need to um, to be much more mindful of because we're growing up in a world where. I mean, people talk about the, you know, the, the coming age of AI and automation and all of that and algorithms taking over our lives. And, and that's that's interesting. Um, but I think that the, 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 the most sort of pressing threat to to civilization at the, at the moment seems to be um, the way in which technology and the way in which have you seen that documentary called The Social Dilemma on Netflix? It's, uh, no, I don't think I have. It's really worth a watch. It's about how 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 Silicon Valley has sort of almost like by accident driven society to the brink of civil collapse by by creating algorithms that make money hand over fist by making people addicted to their screens because the more time that you spend staring at your screen, the more ad the more clicks they get, the more advertising revenue they get, and the the algorithms are very effective at making people addicted as we know the people look at their phone first thing in the morning last thing at night we know that technology addiction is huge they've been really good at that and ideas that they thought that they were bringing in that would be a good thing like they brought in the like button because they think oh people will will like something that will that will you know be nice everyone can sort of spread the love around and then we've got you know stories about young young people self-harming because they post something and it doesn't get enough likes yeah. so yeah, everything yeah. sort of has a flip side and it seems like these algorithms have become um, so so effective by pushing more and more polarizing content in front of people, and that's what they do. And we know, you know, if if I haven't been on Twitter for a while, but I, I still get loads of notifications, and it's just it's pushing me towards towards what it sees as polarizing content. And it's when people have used emotional words. If people say something is disgusting or hateful or spiteful or some sort of a trigger word, that the, the algorithm obviously knows this is what gets clicks. Feelings get yeah. clicks. 
So if somebody makes a makes a YouTube vlog and says, oh, yeah, you know, Donald Trump was a bit of a rough diamond, wasn't he? But, you know, good for the economy. Nobody's going to watch that because it's like nobody's interested in balance, are they? But if you have if you mock up a picture of him with a Hitler moustache or if you have some sort of, you know, make America great stuff on the other side, then people are more drawn to that. And so we have this this world where people are, and you can see it playing out. People are just being sort of fed half the story all the time, and they're sort of getting trapped in these echo chambers, online echo chambers, where you can't you can't sort of see what what it's like to not be you. And people find it really hard to break out of that. And so to to bring this back to what we were just talking about. You know, helping children to to sit with uncertainty. You know, I think that this is something that is that is um, not very well served by the whole knowledge rich curriculum, subject content agenda. Important though that stuff is, it can't be the whole story because we need to teach kids how to sit with uncertainty and how to sort of feel their way in a world where fake news and you know um, propaganda and misinformation and disinformation and just sort of malinformation and gossip and intrigue all sort of blends in. And it's really hard to feel your way through that unless you develop, like you say, a disposition. Some like having straight A stars in geography and history and maths and English is a great way to start your life. I mean, we know that the system won't allow everybody to get straight A stars. But anyway, even if they could all get that solid subject knowledge foundation, I still don't see how having a solid foundation in traditional subject disciplines is a good preparation for such a such an uncertain world. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So this is back to it's like, you know, if you need to establish the the sort of fundamental character traits, what I call the launch pad, then, you know, that's not sufficient anymore, if it ever was. Well, perhaps in the history of of um, mass education, that was sufficient, you know, because schools were originally designed, weren't they, as Ken Robinson always used to say, you know, to, uh, to like the fish, there were two, two kinds of fish, down the bottom of the river, there was a small pool of big fish who were going to be judicious, were going to become the judges and the bishops and the politicians and the what have you and rule and the governor generals and rule the empire. And they needed one set of dispositions. And then most other people needed the dispositions of diligence and punctuality and tidiness and deference because they were going to work in the factories or, or whatever it might be. But, you know, that was then. And this is now, and now the dispositions that people need are different, and uh, like just self self evidently so. I was reading something over the weekend about is it true that the countries that are so have been best have coped best with COVID have female leaders. There was a piece by Gillian Tett in the in the Financial Times, and she her argument was at actually the evidence is not very strong for that. We all know about Jacinda Ardern and some others, uh, but there are there are other examples of male leaders who've dealt well with the situation. But what she what Gillian Tett in this article floats is the idea that the people who have done well are not necessarily women, but they are people of whatever gender uh, who possess a set of character traits that have traditionally been more associated with the feminine or the, or the female. And she particularly picks out things like intellectual humility. There's a lot of interesting research that you probably know in cognitive science about the disposition of intellectual humility, how that assists the development of general knowledge. Interesting paper I was reading the other day. People with more intellectual humility know more. Right. So, you know, quieten down, you traditionalists. This 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 is a good thing to have if you want to grow a lot of secure knowledge securely in people. Uh, but it's also a very good thing to have when you're the prime minister or the president or the premier of a country. You need the intellectual humility to look at what other countries are doing, to be not too proud to copy or um, take advice, 
to be open to what the experts and the scientists are telling you and to be guided by those things. Whereas in some other countries, including perhaps our own, we don't see that level of intellectual humility or genuine open-mindedness or inquisitiveness, a willingness to sit with a complex problem and to accept all the information that you can possibly get. You have a sort of you know, knee-jerk people who are clever, who jump to a conclusion and then devote their cleverness to justifying the course of action that they've jumped to. And I thought that was very interesting. So it's not just, it's like at all levels, all stratas in society, we need to be thinking about what kind of fish are we growing down at the bottom of the aquarium or the bottom of the river. You were talking about AI, James. I've read several reports recently that suggest that in the not very far distant future, the group in society that are going to be most hit by the development of AI are the traditional middle class professions. We're still going to need our plumbers and our hairdressers and our care workers. They're not going to be, you can't delegate those complex social or physical skills to a machine or certainly we're, we're, we're nowhere near being able to do that you can't you know someone in china or bangalore can't fix your car for you we're still going through all those people so this is a very broad brush but being a radiographer someone in india can do that for a tenth of the price of what they can do even conducting an operation you know, I've recently had a had to go into the hospital for an operation. It's perfectly conceivable that that operation could have been conducted remotely by a surgeon in Melbourne. You know, so we need this is a big wake up call. This development of it. It's not just scary stuff about robots. It's about actually hollowing out that world of accountancy and medicine and law large chunks of the law yeah pharm pharmacy so pharmacy exactly you know so and, and that's the sort of traditional hunting ground of school isn't it you know i want my son to be a lawyer i want my daughter to be a dentist or a optician i want my you know whatever it may be you know the, these are the what the the the, the profession the the threats to the traditional modus operandi of school that we should be concerned about, I think. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I'm reading an amazing book at the moment um, called Inadequate. Have you come across this one? No, by I um, Priya Lakhani. Um, she's, I'm interviewing her on Friday. She's going to be my next guest. Um, she writes a lot about this. Um, she's talking about the way in which automation and in particular algorithms are um, you know, coming down the track and how so have you read um there's been a few books so uh, yuval noah harari in homo yeah, deus yeah, and yeah. then in his most recent one in 21 lessons for the 21st century yeah. um he puts it he says the crucial problem isn't creating new jobs it's creating new jobs that humans perform better than algorithms and um and it's not clear what those jobs are yet and so and so it seems very obvious you know like it's another thing that traditionalists often sort of sneer at they often sneer at the idea that you know this phrase we, we need to prepare children for jobs that don't exist yet yeah and there is something sort of inherently absurd in that in that you know claim isn't there how can we how can we you know what do we teach them then if sure. if, if we're preparing them for jobs that don't exist yet but sneering at something doesn't render it untrue i think it's just obvious that we need to be training young people to be autodidactic yep. um and the, and like we said the, you know the school system feels like it's set up to achieve the exact opposite um and priya writes in this book the question of whether we can effectively train people to be autodidacts barely receives any attention in current educational debates this seems like a serious omission um and I, what I find so useful about your metaphor of the river is that, like you say, it, like language is really important, and it changes the, it changes it from a sort of a, a combative punch and Judy, yes, yes, it is, no, it's not, um, you know, argument about who's right here, and it's saying, you know, there needs to be a balance in here, you know, in terms of traditional versus progressives. 
you know, another way to look at that would be individualistic pursuit versus social and interpersonal development. And obviously these two things need to be in 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 balance in some way, you know, mm-hmm. competition and collaboration need to be in balance. And science, I've always thought, is a really good example of, of a field that is that where competition and collaboration are in a fairly sort of healthy state of balance. People sort of want to be the person who gets their name on the thing, but they're also sharing their ideas and building on one another's ideas. Um, and so it feels like it's a much more sort of healthy way to say, let's talk about what the balance is here. Yes, yes, traditionalism is important, but also, like you were saying, the stuff that's happening at the bottom level of that river, that's happening anyway. You're building character, whether you're paying attention to it or not. Yeah. And if you're only focusing on those little rafts of knowledge and information and retrieval practice that's all focused on the surface level of that river... You are creating what's what's. Um, um, I suppose it's funny that you were saying that it's hidden because it seems to me that this idea of the hidden curriculum is sort of partly what lurks at the bottom of the river. This idea that you know that schools are the the unspoken lessons are that you know you get told you you do what you're told. The adults, you know, who are in positions of authority uh, need to be obeyed and not questioned, you know, um, and that the answer is in the textbook and that anything that you want to learn that's that's in, that's of interest to you but that isn't on the textbook is somehow, you know, of no relevance. And if you ask a question that you think is really important and the teacher sort of says, well, that's not on the exam, you know, that 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 builds a sort of an, an epistemic level of, of character development way, way down beneath the surface, which is, you know, uh, I'm not important here. This isn't about me. I need to somehow play the game of this big system or else, you know, um, I'm not going to fit in. I'm not going to succeed. And so I think that it's a very powerful metaphor. And I think that we can move the conversation into much more productive territory when we start to talk about what is the balance here? You know, what kinds of character traits are we wanting to build? Is curiosity as important as, you know, compliance? And what's the balance between these things? Um, And do we want people who can... um, who can solve problems on their own terms, you know, as well as being able to play the game and, you know, um, and to, to be pro-social. So, so you were talking about lots of examples of schools where this stuff is happening, that we, if this is not a sort of an either-or situation, we can do both. And I certainly found in, in my own research that, you know, we developed these character traits, and in particular, confidence. The young people really spoke about how they got confident through, through the emphasis on oracy, and they also did way better in their exams than than the control group. And yeah. So you you can do both of these things at once. Yeah. So the question is scaling up, you know. And so let's move into the problems and solutions. Like we, when we spoke yesterday, you sort of said that there are many problems that, that we've talked about, you know, in previous episodes in this podcast. And you were saying that in some sense, learning to learn sort of presupposes what's wrong. It's like, you know, by saying that we need to do things in this way, it presupposes that there are all of these problems. So let's talk about the big problem, which is like, how can we scale this up faster so that it's not necessarily even fast? Maybe it's faster the right word. I don't want to I don't want to sort of to, to create a sort of an artificial sense that this this is something that needs to be done very quickly, because I think that fast implementation is often bad implementation it takes sort of five years to change the culture of a school in such a way that it's sustained in the long term so we're not talking about quick wins here but i do think that it's fast in the sense that it's an urgent agenda you know like it feels without wanting to overstate the case like you know things are things are pretty hairy for for the human race right now there are there are many very serious existential threats that we face. And I think that it's very clear from looking at the news for five minutes or to stick your head into Twitter for five minutes that, you know, people need to learn how to get along with one another better, for example. Yes. Who was it? Was you, were you reminding me the other day of some quote about, about um, there's, a, there's, civil, there's a race between education and catastrophe or something? Yeah, yeah, H.G. Wells. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really feels like that. So, yeah, I think can I can I just I'd 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 love to move on to that, but I'm very interested in um, I am generally very interested in this idea of balance and fluidity, and I think I'll put my hands up and say I think I like some other people have been guilty of producing a kind of little list of desirable traits, 
Um, and I've been thinking, I haven't written much about this yet, but I think it's more accurate and more helpful often to see, to be talking about not just single, like a single list of these are the, the, are these are the desirable traits, but of kind of linked pairs of things which are not exactly opposite ends of a dimension or a spectrum, but which need to be in balance exactly the way you were saying. And you could, you know, you could go down like resilience is great. Resilience in the sense of sticking with something difficult, except when it isn't, except when it's a waste of time, except when you realize that actually it's not that important. You know, resilience means not giving up because you're feeling stupid. Resilience is sticking with something that's worthwhile or necessary to the best of your ability. But also, you know, that needs to be balanced with a bit of discernment about is this is this worth being resilient about or not? You know, it wasn't it wasn't until I was in my 40s, I think, that I realized that you didn't have to finish a book. You know, like you, you started a book and, you know, you're sort of plodding your way through it, but you think there must be something wrong with me or I've got to kind of got to get to the end of it or something or other. If it's not delivering what you want, whether that's information or entertainment or philosophical insight or what something, junk it, right? Life's, life's too short. So giving up is a positive pole of sticking with it. It's the, the, the question is the balance when. Likewise, as you were saying in the your very nice example of the science world, and there's lots of sort of anthropological research on the most productive scientific labs, which says there is absolutely this balance, shifting, fluid balance between being sociable and being solitary, being competitive and being collaborative. I remember in one of these research reports, a, a, somebody from a very, you know, one of the most iconically successful science labs saying, you know, I have in my office, I have doors open days and I have door closed days. In other words, I toggle between when I welcome interruption when I'm happy to be sociable, but people know when my door's closed, I'm thinking, I'm thinking hard and I don't want to be interrupted. So I think, you know, there's a, the next step, like the sixth generation, let's say, playfully, of learning to learn, will be more, will be revolving around that sense of balance. Interestingly, one of the most long standing of these lists <clears throat> is the learner profile of the International Baccalaureate one of the grandfathers of this approach. And usually somewhere down towards the end of that list is balanced, which is like a meta quality, isn't it? Like, like being balanced between being curious, but also sometimes being circumspect, being self-assertive, being confident, but also sometimes having humility, being adventurous, but also sometimes being methodical. So I think there's another stage we need to get to, which is, again, more complicated. You know, you can't boil it down to simplicity, which is helping people understand that this or, or the balance between reason and imagination, learning how to, again, the, the, the research literature on creativity shows very strongly that the creative people are not all imaginative. They're people who are fluid enough and skillful enough to be able to toggle between it, phases, and they might, this might be quite micro-toggling, or it might be quite long-term, phases of being dreamy, imaginative, wacky, discursive, blue skiesy thinking, and then absolutely able to take that into a more analytical, critical mindset. Build a laboratory culture around that, and you've got a world beating, you know, MRC microbiological unit with four Nobel prizes sitting in the in the rooms down the corridor. So I think I just wanted to endorse what you were saying about that. And that's sort of leading edge of my thinking. It's like, how do we turn that into something that teachers can find useful is is a, is a real problem. Um, but you wanted to move us on quite rightly to Remind me where 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 are we going to go next? It was the this question of of scaling up. Oh, the scaling up. Yeah, that's right. So, I think the work. The, so you need to look at the barriers, 
which is a little bit about what the future of thinking, the future of sort of the future of teaching, my book, is about trying to say what you know what what are the resistances, what are the belief systems that make people skeptical or cautious or cynical about the possibilities that we've been talking about, and then how do we work with those? Um, and I, I think the other thing is, and that we'll leave that perhaps for for another time. I think the other thing is, you know, we've got to the point where we're saying, what builds these dispositions, whether we take them as balanced pairs or an individual list, is the long term, the abiding culture of the classroom. You know, you nurture. That, that, that's it's the these are the words we need to use. You don't train, you nurture, you cultivate. You need more like a horticultural metaphor rather than a, a, a mechanistic metaphor. But when you start talking about culture, people's eyes glaze over. It's like, what do you mean, culture? So a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last, I and my colleagues have been doing over the last four years is around what we're now calling the learning power approach, which I think is like a general school of thought which you and I have been illustrating in this talk, but we could just as well be sitting around a table with Ron Richart, David Perkins, Art Costa, uh, Ian Mitchell from Monash University, etc., etc., etc. Umpteen different people are sharing like 95% of the DNA that that we have that that you and I are talking about. Um, but what, what, what's been happening recently and what we've been doing with the learning power approach is to try and distill out what, 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 is this, what is this cultivation? What do we mean by culture? What are the practicalities behind this? And then how do we present that in a way that is like a workbook for teachers in a way that they can do so just sort of take off a little bit at a time? You know, and so I think being able to demythologize that metaphor, the metaphor of culture and cultivating the, the, what we need to do in order to gently but persistently grow these habits of mind, the big fish down the bottom of the river, we, we need to be, to be offering teachers. It's like a slow sense of progression, not a whole big thing. That's one of the big things that stops scaling up is quite rightly teachers going, oh my God, I've been a leopard for 30 years and now they're telling me I've got to be a tiger on Monday. You know, and it's like, it's a big thing. It's like a radical new thing, like we've all got to do building learning power now, or we're all gonna be a inquiry-based school or something like that. So actually creating a doable glide path, which is full of little things where busy, hard-pressed teachers in normal schools can say to themselves, oh, I could do that. Oh, that's pretty neat. Oh, yeah, I think I'll try that with one of my classes tomorrow. Those are the golden grains, aren't they? Yeah. Where you get where you link the high level conceptualization, where we talk about dispositions and culture and habits of mind and the mindset for the future and all that kind of stuff. So you and you follow like Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, you follow like the thread that takes you down to a little practice in the classroom, which is introducing a tiny little routine called try three before me, which you might have, you may well have come across and lots of teachers are using, which says, when you're stuck, you can put your hand up and I'll come over to help you. But before, but you know very well that the first thing I'll ask you is, what are the three things you've already tried to help yourself? And that tiny little shift, that little strategy that anybody could use in any classroom has power to it. It helps to build resilience. Kids get used to the fact that they need to have something to say about what they've done to, to unstick themselves before you'll rescue them. You don't leave them to flounder helplessly in the deep end, but you go over and say, okay, let me do, I'm gonna leave you just for another two minutes and just grapple, see if you can grapple a little bit more and see if you can find, and then if you were really, really, really stuck, then I'll come back and see if I can give you a hint about how to get going again. That's different from 
the teacher who jumps in with a ready-made explanation, who rescues students from difficulties instantaneously, either by caring or by explaining, right? Premature rescuing by, by caring. Never mind, sweetheart, don't worry. I know that's a difficult book. Why don't you come and sit by me and we'll do something, right? The rescuing by caring or the rescuing by, I'll rescue you from having to think by making it even more simple and talking a bit more slowly and explaining it in words of one syllable again, right? Both of those things deprive students systematically of the opportunity to learn how to rescue themselves, don't they? So you can see like, you know, what's exciting about this new wave of teaching, this third way, if you like, is the way you can connect tiny little things that any teacher could go, oh, I could do that in the course of teaching the Tudors or simultaneous equations or whatever it is, right? I could be introducing these little things, which all of which are cultural signifiers, which signal a different mood in the classroom, which is when you come into my room, it's cool to have figured it out for yourself. And after a month of that, you'll have created a shift in the groundswell of culture in the classroom. So you can throw your kids a tricky problem. You say, I'm going to leave you to work on this in pairs for 10 minutes. See what headway you can make. And then after eight minutes, you say, uh, OK, hold on a minute, everybody. Just pause for a moment. Um, would you like me to tell you the answer? And all your kids go, no, miss, no, we're nearly there. Just give us another. We need another two or three minutes. Let's see if we can figure it out. Because they've learned the pride, the satisfaction, the nectar of having done it for themselves. And we can create that by a small series of shifts in the practicalities of our classroom. What we notice, the way we talk, the kinds of activities, even individual words like Becky Carlson, one of my icon primary school teachers who you know, uses the word tricky a lot. Are you ready to do something tricky today? And the kids go, oh, yeah, come on, bring it on, miss. Right. It's like that's different from are you ready to do something that, is, that you're going to probably fail at and will make you feel stupid and ashamed. Right. Which is the mood in many classrooms, isn't it? If you don't do it right quickly, you're stupid, is the subtext in a lot of classrooms. So we can change that. It's within teachers' scope to change their language, to change little minute details of what's going on in the classroom. One tiny little example, James, but multiply those up. Give a sort of glide path for teachers, which says, right, you've done that one now. Now you could make, would you like to add this little bit? Would you like to create this little tweak? Would you like to add that little thing? Right. And then you gradually assemble or grow to stick with the horticultural metaphor. You add nutrients and, you know, over the course of a month or two, you find that for most of the kids in most of your classrooms, you've changed the mood music. The undercurrent, the undertow is now it's cool to figure it out for ourselves rather than we'll give up at the first sign of difficulty and wait to be rescued. Yes. Thank you. That's interesting. So so you're talking about examples of things that, that can be done at the level of the classroom with things like three before me and the, just the language and language is always so important using language like tricky. Um, and then I'm also thinking about things at the level of of schools and I don't honestly think that it needs to go higher than that. I don't think that there's any point in thinking about this agenda at the level of policy. Because even if it was brought in as a policy, they, at the national level, policies change so rapidly that it would just become, you know, tomorrow's chip paper. And actually, the schools that you're talking about have already made these changes within the existing system. And so it's not like we need to change the paradigm from the top down. But even to come back to the level of the school. Yeah, school leaders are critical. But, but that, yeah, they are. Of course, school leaders are critical, but also... I think that some of the problems that have happened in the past with things like building learning power and with other with other with not just within the realm of learning to learn, but with things like assessment for learning, say, 
although there is quite a lot of overlap, I think, between those two um, schools of thinking, is that top-down implementation just doesn't work so often like it's just there are so many reasons for for this and it's and it's a problem because it's our go-to thing nearly all changes that are implemented in schools are implemented by senior leaders or head teachers and it's a top-down thing um and for so many reasons number one people don't like being told what to do even when it's a really good idea people there's just something about like the lack of autonomy people sort of resent being being made to dance to the latest tune even if it's a really good idea um, and then there's just the sort of the, the practicalities that like senior leaders, their responsibilities often change, right? So the, one of the, they're doing behavior one year and the next year they're on the timetable. The year after that, they're in charge of assessments or curriculum, say. And so, and, and all they move schools, right? And, and whatever happens, like the, the, the agenda, the sort of the momentum and energy that they might have got behind a particular thing sort of collapses behind them and we're back to square one. And this is something that I'm really interested in, as you know, this, this sort of emerging field of implementation science, as it's referred to. It, it's sort of come out of the psychological world, hasn't it? Implementation science. It's partly, partly been born of the replication crisis that ha that's been happening in psychology, where people are finding that the, the, the big sort of foundational studies aren't replicatable and don't apply to new, to, to dynamic sort of real world context. Yeah. Um, and so... The, to, I suppose my question is, you know, if not top down, then what? Mm. Um, it's I, I I I mentioned a little while ago the series of learning power approach books. We've we've stopped at four. We're exhausted at the moment. But the the fourth book is a book for school leaders called Powering Up Your School: <clears throat> Learning Power Approach to School uh, to School Leadership. And it's very different from uh, most books about leadership, which have some kind of theory. You can read, you know, Andy Hargreaves' theory about this or Michael Fullan's theory about that, about, you know, cultural capital or some sort of highfalutin stuff, or you're this kind of leader or that kind of leader. This is a collaborative, this book is born of a co collaborative project with a group of school leaders in a whole big variety of different schools uh, large, small, primary, secondary, urban, rural, Australian, Vietnamese, Irish, Spanish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. School leaders who have been successful at creating this culture change, and them telling their stories, and picking out the grains of gold from their stories. So it's a kind of anthropology or a kind of sort of ecology, a narrative, if you like, about what does this actually look like to lead this kind of delicate, complex, slow, demanding culture change process in your school. So that I'm one of six authors um, on, the, on, on that book. Um, and we all work together, and there are many others who didn't help to actually put the book together, but on whose expertise we've drawn um, a total of about 20 schools, if you like, where people have been, have, have really, by anybody's imagination, have made good strides at creating uh, an indestructible culture. And that's, that's, that, that's a big point. We might might come back to that later on. And the point that you make about not being top down <clears throat> or back to this balance about leadership, like when do you push and when do you flex? Dylan William wrote, as often uses the phrase, he's wrote a really good paper called tight but loose about that balance. Again, it's that balance, isn't it? And that balance is critical and it's a dynamic balance if it, it shifts like the pivot point on the seesaw shifts over time about at what point and with whom are you going to be more democratic, more responsive, more in listening mode? And are there moments when you need to say you need to push back against the pushback of your staff and say, actually, no, you remember we committed to doing this, so I'm going to hold the line on this. And so it's a bit like being executive rather than legislature, le legislature, isn't it? It's like it's like distinguishing between those two functions of government. So the head teacher 
works to create as much consensus to get to build buy-in. We have a whole fat chapter on how you go about getting buy-in. The slow process of seeding the idea of innovation, of allowing dissent, of you know what the time scale of that is, of how you work with what one of my teacher friends calls cynics corner in the in the staff room, all of that practical stuff. Yeah. And then how you how you how you build on that mandate. You you work to get some kind of a mandate from the staff, and then you can use that in your role as chief executive rather than chief vision vision person, right? To kind of hold hold you on hold you on track. Um, so this is it's really interesting book. I'm I'm really proud of this of this book and the work that my colleagues put in, because it is very it's like multiple pathways. You know there is no one pathway. There is no, you know Guy Claxton's model of school leadership, but there is first of all clarity about vision. Like where the hell do I do we want to go? What would better look like? What does better mean to us in this school? And then. How do we build language around that? How do we build staff development around that? How do we involve parents with that? How do we involve students with that? And so on. So we unpick again in this sort of rather meticulous, delicate way, what the different threads or strands are of that culture change process and what the little, a bit like try through before me, you know, what are the little practical things that born of hard won wisdom from these innovators, what can we share with other people that you might be, they might go, oh, that's a neat idea. I could try that with my staff rather than I could try that with my kids. And I think that's a model, if you like, of thinking about how to help school leaders with this delicate process of culture change which is consonant with the whole philosophy that we've been talking about rather than a command and control model. Mm. That sounds amazing. I'm, I'm writing something similar at the moment. I'm currently writing a book on implementation science. So, so oh, um, wow. I think that we're going to have lots uh, in common. So I'm going to really look forward to reading that. And I love how it's rooted in, in real world sort of, you know, case studies. Absolutely. I, I, totally agree with you about the importance of setting the vision or what Simon Sanek talks about as start with why or finding yeah. your why because it's a lot easier to get yeah. people on board with the what and the how when they understand the why and I think that you know things like like it could be small things but like I say language is important and I really think that that river metaphor is a very powerful way for people to to understand the way that these things are all happening simultaneously anyway and so that we can start paying attention to other things. Yeah. I, I also think that, you know, something that's happened recently, this isn't just some sort of like Govian, you know, um, idea that's been implemented at the Department for Education, this whole idea of the knowledge rich curriculum and people focusing on things like cognitive load theory and retrieval practice and what have mm, you. Mm. Um, this is something that has been, this agenda has been really taken on board by, by classroom teachers and there are so many people tweeting and writing blogs and writing books. The amount of education books that are being published at the moment is absolutely phenomenal, many of them by practicing teachers. And they're really taking these ideas on, on board. Um, but I think that at the moment, it feels like they're coming from quite a sort of a, 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 a narrow bandwidth mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, it feels like it's very much focused on that surface level of the river. Yeah. And I think that, that your forthcoming book, which, as I say, is just a, a brilliant read, um, is going to really help people to sort of to see those second and third layers of the river and hopefully will lead to similarly sort of proliferated, um, you know, um, publications of people talking about, OK, let's start to talk about what good practice looks like at level two yes. and what does good look like at level three. Um, so I'm really looking forward to to um, mm. picking up that conversation with you yeah, when great. next we meet. It'll be in a few months time. Yeah, me too. But there are these like these there's just naiveties. It's like lots of people are kind of, you know, using the slogan of what works. Right. We've got to get the right research head like what works yes. or the, the Education Endowment Foundation. What works? Hold on a minute. Works for what? 
for what outcomes? Yeah. You see, if you don't say that, then you just assume that it's grades and university entrance and the good old stuff, right? But what works for one set of outcomes is going to be different from what works for a different set of outcomes. What works if you value all three layers of the river is going to be different, you almost said this in so many words a while ago, is going to be different from what you do if you only value the top layer of the river. Yeah. Right? And and what is the, what's exciting about this new approach to pedagogy, the pedagogical shift that is going on around the world with little pockets of innovation in which we need to scale up, is people getting, you know, is, is getting clear about you know what that what that shift is what it involves doing it in their own way and uh, and then spreading it to others yes it does feel like it's it's taken its sweet time yeah, <laughs> learning to learn to, to to get to this point and you know like to some people might sort of understandably say you know if if people have been talking about this for 50 years and we're still not there you know maybe this is a bad idea and maybe it's just too complicated and it's just sort of just too hard and to to make it happen but it feels to me like we're not even just on the verge of making this happen it is happening yes. in schools all over the planet and and we I'm very anglo-centric in my sort of view because obviously you know I live in England and that's lots of the people that I'm engaging with but around the world people are having these conversations uh, much more so than they are here um, and so I feel very hopeful for yeah, yeah. Um, for the future that it, it it really feels like after all of this sort of soul searching and exploring all of these you know uh, dead ends and and ideas that that were looked attractive at a face value but turned out to not really be you know all that they were cracked up to be it feels like having learned those hard lessons and having sort of embraced you know the traditionalist agenda because we're not this is not anti that agenda it's it's about what's that phrase that Buckminster Fuller uses he says that if you want to change something you don't have to defeat the existing order you have to include and transcend it mm -hmm. I'm, exactly I'm paraphrasing so. but that's yeah. the idea that it just yeah. it's sort of um, it includes, I think that's a Ken Wilber phrase. He talks about include and transcend. Uh -huh. And yeah. I think that that's, it feels like we're, we're poised for this um, transcendent moment. Yeah, and I think what's, what, what's happening now, and, and in your, your Fear is the Mind Killer book, our Learning Power Approach books, the books that Ron Berger and his associates are producing, like Learning That Last is a valuable, fantastic book, or Becoming Leaders of Their Own Learning, I think is another one. Um, is that we're now able to sort of demythologize this. This isn't just something that brilliant classroom teachers or courageous school leaders do. This is something that we can, you know, actually we, we can pull it apart. We can see what's going on here. We can distill and bottle and disseminate some of this now. And we have research behind it. We have the cognitive science behind learning to learn, which is a whole lot better than the cognitive science behind cognitive load theory, right? It's, it's grounded in good contemporary understandings of the mind and how the mind grows, and an increasingly persuasive body of, of in-school evidence, of, you know, evidence of effectiveness, some of it still at the level of case studies. But, you know, I don't want to get into this argument, but like the whole idea of like the only evidence that counts is your randomized control, double blind thingy is, uh, as you know, you write very nicely about in, in the Mind Killer book, is, uh, is an unnecessary and unjustified straitjacket on what we consider to be evidence in education. It's like in most other departments of life in law or medicine or business the business world or something or other people are perfectly happy to talk about character traits and qualitative evidence you know to judge to do an annual appraisal on the basis of a 300 and 360 degree appraisal in schools oh no that's far too subjective we've got to have a checklist we've got to have a written exam it's like come on wake up education the rest of the world knows how to mitigate the risks of bias involved in people making those subjective judgments without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
Absolutely. There are some there are some strong echoes here of the conversation that I had with Ian Cunningham. Uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that conversation when it comes out. Mm. Um, and as I say, um, I'm really looking forward to picking this up in a few months in the spring term when we can get into the. So the title of the book is called the forthcoming book is called The Future of Teaching and the Myths That Hold It Back. Mm. Um, and I really like that that title. And we, so we're going to get into some neo traditional myths. Um, and half truths, and so um, we'll leave that as a cliffhanger for now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The book, I, with all being well, the book will be published. I think the back end of April. So I, I hope if you're listening to this podcast, we might have whetted your appetite, but please keep it slightly whetted uh, for the next for the next three months uh, and, until the book is available. Watch this space. Indeed, indeed. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Well, thank you so much for spending your time with me this morning. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, likewise, James. It's been, it's really good. You know, I, it is an exciting time, I think, to be involved in education because I truly think, I don't think this is just a kind of romantic self-deception. I think there is enough evidence now, there's enough evidence in practice, there's enough case studies now for what you and I have been working our way towards to become the new orthodoxy. And the faster that happens, the better. So thank you for your work with these podcasts and thank you for having me on. Time is a measure of change. We don't have much time. Time is a measure of change.